Hi, my name is Joshua. Please listen as my dad reads the Bible. I'm going to invite you to make your way today back to the book of Genesis, and we'll be in Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19, a, 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 a concept today, and a, uh, for the lack of any better term, a difficult portion of Scripture for us to look at without becoming um, bogged down, without getting hung up in the weeds, as it were, without focusing on uh, the minutia of things. I want us to get an overarching view today of God's narrative of Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't want to be graphic. We don't want to be crass. We do not want to offend, but we do need to make sure that we are having biblical integrity and biblical truth in our conversation. And so we'll look at some things today. And so let me just preface things today. Those of you watching online today may cause some interesting questions in your family, especially with younger children. And so just know that there are things we will talk about this morning that have a as they put on television, a sensitive nature. Okay, I've, we got that out of the way. I'm going to invite you, out of respect for the holy, living, inerrant Word of God, if you are able to, to stand for its reading today. If you're at home watching us, you can stand up too, but nobody's going to know the difference. Genesis chapter 19, verses 23 through 29. If you're ready for God's word, would you say amen? The sun had risen over the earth when Lot came to Zoar. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all of the valley and all the inhabitants of the city and even what grew on the ground. But his wife from behind him looked back. She became a pillar of salt. Now Abram rose early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before the Lord and he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the valley and he saw and behold, the smoke of the land ascended like the smoke of a furnace. Verse 29, thus it came about when God destroyed the cities of the valley that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. God, I, I ask this morning simply that your, your word would be fresh for us. God, that today as we seek your face and seek your truth, that Isaiah would prove true, that every word that comes from your mouth would not return to you void, but would accomplish what it has been set forth to accomplish. God, even the hard stuff, even the stuff that is uncomfortable, we know that you've given us so that we may learn, we may be drawn closer to you, and Father, our service to you might become sweeter than it was yesterday. God, I ask that today as we speak about your word, that our eyes would be open, our hearts would be open, that we would receive what you have for us to receive today, that anything that would come from me would be stricken from the record of our memory that we would know nothing, hear nothing, we would engage in nothing other than what your scripture says. May that be our focus as we leave out of here this afternoon. Thus saith the Lord our God. God, guard our hearts and our minds. May they focus solely on you as we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And we pray you would add to our minds, our hearts, and our hands the ability to serve. We pray all this in the name of Christ our Savior. All of God's people said, amen, and amen, and you may be seated today. Today, as we talk about one of the most, I will use the term controversial, if you are not in the, the, the conversation with folks about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and what they represent and what they indicate, if you are not in the conversations about what the, the reason for destruction was, if you don't engage in those conversations, uh, let me just put this as a blanket statement. There are entireties of classes and teachings and dogmas who will teach to you 
that the reason that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed was because they were inhospitable. Plus, <laughs> there are entire groups of people who want to take um, a particular word or a particular phrase and say, well, see, this over here is different than everywhere else, and so it has to be something else. There is, within the framework of our seminaries, over the last probably 12 years, there have been a conflict of teaching that has grown up where that because Lot um, was ugly to the people and wouldn't give them what they wanted, that means that pride was the root of the cause of destruction. And they will do everything they can to avoid the conversation concerning the sexual sins of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. I'd ask you this question. You can ponder it yourself. I know the answer for me growing up. Um, you know this, that I didn't start going to church until I was about nine years old. We moved from Oklahoma to Texas, and the first memories I have of being in church is Woodland Place Baptist Church down off of 1488 when it was a two-lane road. And if it was uh, Renaissance Fair Festival season, you just didn't go anywhere because 1488 was a parking lot. And I can count on one hand the memories I have of hearing anybody ever preach about Sodom and Gomorrah. Because it's uncomfortable. And most good, good Christian folks don't want to talk about the good stuff, right? The, 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 the fun stuff, the fluff. But if we're going to be obedient to what we have talked about and following God's narrative, we cannot skip and go, well, you know what? That's uncomfortable to talk about. Let's move ahead and we'll just bypass it all together and not reference it. Now, um, please understand, we are, in our, in our work through God's narrative, going to skip some places and, and talk primarily about some major characters and those kinds of things. But we have to lay the foundational truths before we can go any further. Because at time after time after time, in the pages of God's Scripture, from this point forward... The activities and the sin and the condemnation and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah are referenced as a, as a litmus test. They are, as it were, the line in the sand in the Alamo that said this, cross this if you dare. Those who want to go home, leave, but everybody else, you come and cross this line and we're going to stand here. It's the Native American tribes of the panhandle of Texas and Oklahoma that drove their shaft of their stick into the ground with a rope tied to their ankle. And they said, we will go no further. This is where we are going to stand on the solid foundation. This is where we are. This is who we are. And we will not be moved. And if we want to trust the book of Jude and the words of Christ and the books of Corinthians and the book of Romans about Sodom and Gomorrah and the sin that was there. We have to know what it was. And we can't infer. We have to look at the scripture and get an understanding that in our passage today, God destroyed the people, the city, and the very ground of Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because they were proud. I want you to understand something. There is great truth to that statement in the day in which we live. Pride goeth before the fall. You've heard that, right? Do you realize what we just came out of in the month of June? Pride month. I'm going to say this and I'll be in trouble, but it's okay. Can you imagine a heterosexual parade where that men and husbands and wives march through town fornicating in the way that only husbands and wives should do? Can you imagine the public outcry that would occur? Do you know that happened in Houston last month, the second week of June? The homosexual community, the alphabet community, LGBTQIA+, had a parade in downtown Houston 
where men and women were completely unclothed, engaging in sexual activity down the streets of Houston. And it made the news not as a condemnation, but in celebrating pride. I have news for you. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of pride. But it wasn't the arrogance of pride. It was the pride in living a lifestyle that is abhorrent to the very nature and command of God. Now we got that out of the way. We can talk about something else, right? I want you to look at this. I've got four things for you very briefly this morning. Just four. And you know these words. Do you remember in school they would teach you the who, what, where, when, why, and how? I have, I have taken a page out of my mother's grammar book. And we're going to answer the why, the when, the who, and the what today. I want us to talk about and get an understanding of a few things. Number one, I want us to look at what does it teach us? It teaches us why that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. I want you to understand, Sodom and Gomorrah were not destroyed because God had nothing better to do on a Tuesday. God did not one day go, you know what, I'm bored today. What can I do to disrupt everybody's world? Well, you know what? They're in the bottom of the desert, the bottom of the Dead Sea. There's not much activity going there. There's a whole lot of people. If I just destroy that, it won't tear up everybody else's plan. And, and eventually what will happen is it will all be forgotten about and argued with. And so we can just take care of it now. No, God, God, God didn't do that. God destroyed them for one reason and one reason only. And if you look back at chapter 18, verse 20. Chapter 18, verse 20, the, our passage deals directly with the destruction. And the question is, why is it so important for us to understand this? When you go back to chapter 18, verse 20, the Lord God said, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great. And then what does it say? And their sin is exceedingly great. Overflowingly great. And the language I want you to understand is this. When it, the scripture says exceedingly or mightily or, or devastatingly, whatever your version says, it comes from a Hebrew word that means this, to slosh over. And what it means and proves for us is this. That Sodom and Gomorrah, the sins they were committing, were not just affecting the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were overflowing onto the residents around them. And they were overflowing on other cities. And by the language we read in the destruction, it was even overflowing into the ground. Now, I don't know if you understand this, but if you're sinning so much, that your sin engages in the lives of other people. God's word condemns that. The book of Malachi, as a matter of fact, the priests who weren't preaching, they had perverted the word of God. God condemned them because they were leading other people astray. Paul says the same thing to the church at Corinth. Your lifestyle of abhorrence is a stumbling block to those who are trying to come to Christ. And what happens is, is we begin to leave li lead lives that lead people not to the cross of Christ, but away from it. And we engage in things. That's why the scripture says that we need to study and we need to show ourselves approved and we need to learn and be transformed. is so that we are drawn closer to God. Why is it important to live a life of a Christian? Why did Paul say, live a lifestyle that is worthy of the gospel? He said it to the church at Philippi and to the church at Corinth and to the church at Colossae. Why? To draw the lost to the cross. Why? Because there is only one gospel that saves. 
And it is not easy believism. It is not self-actualization. It is not if it feels good, do it. It is not whatever looks good, whatever is popular, whatever is, uh, you know, everybody approves of. No. There is only one gospel that saves, and it's believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if we live a lifestyle that is opposite of that, guess where we lead people? Exactly. And what do we know that they were doing in Sodom and Gomorrah? They were living such a lifestyle that even Lot understood, wait a minute. Do you know why Lot had those guys come into his house? Because he knew what was going to happen to visitors and aliens and strangers when they walked through the gates of Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't that Lot got a secret message, there's guys coming, let's get them. They walked past his house at the gate and he said this, y'all better not go into town because bad stuff is going to happen to you if you go. Why? Because that was the norm. That was what, it was just the way things were. Why were Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? Let me answer that for you in a very quick statement. Man's sin. Let me express this to you very quickly. I believe, based on the foundational word of Scripture, that for the attempted rape, the attempted homosexuality, for the attempted violation of man or natural law by man's own law, that God was disgusted by and condemned Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't care what label you put on that. If you want to call it pride, great. If you want to call it inhospitability, however you say that word, great. I don't care what label you put on it because all of them are tied up in that, in that language that we read where that the two guys, the messengers came into Lot's house and the place almost beat the door off the hinges for one reason and that was to have sexual relations with visitors, aliens, and strangers that had come into town. And they were so violent that if the angels had not blinded them, they would have busted the door down and taken what they wanted. Oh, but the sin was that they were inhospitable. Yeah, that's inhospitable. We went through and drove through a bunch of little small towns through Texas and Oklahoma the last couple of days, going to Oklahoma to visit family. When we passed through Alex, Texas, I promise you this, there was not a giant sign on the wall that said, get out by sundown because bad things will happen to you. Now, there are some places I've been where you don't want to be there after dark. But I assure you of this, I was never worried about having sexual assault occur. Just the tires taken off my car. Or my wallet stolen out of my pocket. That's what it means to be inhospitable. The sin of the town and the sin within our lives is the reason for death and destruction. That's echoed in the book of Romans chapter 6 verse 23. The wages of sin is death. Right? Right? Not the wages of somebody else's sin. Not the repercussions of someone else's problems. It is our sin debt that causes our death and destruction. If anybody ever asks you this, why does a good God let anybody go to hell? Send people to hell. Your answer is he don't. You're born going there. How do we know that? God did not send his, world, his son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world is condemned already. Why? Because all sin and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? If anybody says they don't sin, they're a liar. Lying is a sin. Which means, hey, I think I've heard this somewhere before. If you break one, you're guilty of them all. And if you're guilty of them all, guess what? You're unrighteous. And if you're unrighteous, guess what? You have no place with God. If you have no place with God, you're separated from life. That means this. Sin equals death. Why were Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? 
because sin was sloshing over. There was so much of it. Here's the question. When? I'm not talking about a timeline. I'm, I don't have a chart. If you go in my Sunday school classroom, on two of the walls, there's this long timeline. If you go in my office, there's one that's a circle. And there's all kinds of dates and that sort of thing. And, and it's, it's this fantastic thing. I love to look at it because every time I do, I find something else. Also in my office, if you want to, there's a family tree from Adam to Christ. And all the branches that go off of it. And it's pretty incredible to see. I'm not talking about a date. Okay. What I'm telling you is this. Why is it that God waited for their sin to become so heavy that he didn't have any other choice? Because it's not fair to Nineveh, is it? You understand what I'm saying? God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh, preach to him, and tell him if they don't quit, I'm going to destroy him." And you read the third chapter of Jonah after the whole great fish story. He spits him out on dry land. Now he's been, he's been eat up by the, by the digestive juices of the great fish. And he smells like the inside of a fish. And he goes to a place of fish worshipers. And he tells them, that, look, I just got barfed up by a fish. And they're like, you, wait, wait, time out. You smell like a fish. You look like you've been inside a fish. You're telling us a story about a great fish. We're going to listen to what you have to say. And he preaches to them. And God didn't destroy them. Now, time out. He owes an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah then, right? Hey, let me, let, me, let me just share something with you. If you're in the book of Jonah, I want you to turn two pages over in your scripture to the book of Nahum. And do you know what Nahum is? It's the absolute destruction of Nineveh. Because the sin was so exceedingly great. See, God didn't change his mind about destroying Nineveh in the end of Job. God put a pause button because they started living the right way. And when they stopped, guess what? The con condemnation of God was brought into full force. So when was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? This is going to prove to be an interesting conversation. They were destroyed at the timing of God's choosing. I want for you to understand this, and we'll talk about this very briefly and move on. Do you understand the last thing that happened before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed? This is one of those things that's hard to, to just to, to dwell on for a long time, so I'm going to struggle with this. If you read the passage of Genesis chapter 19, I want for you to read through that and count how many times that the angels had to grab Lot by the hand and snatch him and move him around. Why? Because he liked his sin. And it wasn't until old Lot made a deal. And it's not like the devil went down to Georgia. Lot's deal was this. I can't run that far. Let me go over here. A little other, a little other town. It's not too far. We can make it that far. And I said, fine. But you need to understand something. We can't do anything until you get out of the way. Why? Because God had compassion on Lot. We know because of Galatians chapter 4, in the fullness of time, God brought forth his son. We know that language. We know that passage. We talk about it at Christmas time every year. But there's another time when in the fullness of time, God is going to do something. Matthew chapter 24, a great passage about the end times and what's going to come along. And when you get to that verse 35, 36, 37 area, especially Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus talking about when all that's going to occur says this, nobody knows what time it is. We don't know. I don't know. The angels don't know. You don't know. Only the Father knows. 
But there are some things that have to be in place before that occurs. And we can watch the times, we can mark the time. But if anybody ever comes to you and says, oh, by the way, on, on January the 13th, 2024, Jesus is coming back. Ignore them. As a matter of fact, you have the biblical authority to say this, you're lying. Because no man knows the hour. That's for free. I want you to tell, I want, I want you, I'm going to give you as, as prophetic, not pathetic, prophetic, of a word as I will give about the timetable of God and his return. You ready? He's waiting on the last one that he has compassion on to get out of town. Because when the last soul that God has instructed to be saved gets saved, guess what? I don't know if you've read the book of Revelation. Um, it's unpleasant. I don't know if you've read Matthew 24. It's not Sunday go to meeting. There is no nap. I, I will say this because it's funny, but it's also true. My father, in all of the years I've known my dad as a pastor, has preached two sermons that I can quote the titles of them verbatim. The first one was this. What in hell do you want? Meaning, what do you expect hell to look like? And the follow-up to that sermon was this. There is no aspirin in hell. Meaning this, it's not fun. And as the professor provost of, of the University of Utah said in a debate, he said, I, I, I believe when I die, I'm dead, and it's over with, and this is all there is. But even if I'm wrong and I die, at least I'm going to hell where I don't have to listen to all those preachers and teachers. That is the mindset of countless millions of people in the world. And it is our job to share the good news that you don't have to worry about going to hell without the preachers and the teachers. All you have to worry about is this. If you believe and confess and repent, and trust. See, I don't, I, I'm not worried. See, he's worried. That professor is worried about what happens next. I'm not worried. And I'm not worried about whether this is all there is or if there's something else. I'm not worried about what's going to take place. Why? Because as a nine-year-old boy, when I heard the gospel... It invested itself into my heart and the Spirit made it real. And I confessed Christ. I believed in His death, burial, and resurrection for nobody else in the universe but, but for me. And I became a saved individual. And from that point until today as I'm speaking, guess what? I'm not worried. Why? Because I used to be a blasphemer and a violent man. And I acted in ignorance and unbelief. But God chose me. And there's coming a day when the last choice of God is made. And when that happens, it's over. <laughs> we went and played putt-putt. Y'all remember putt-putt? Y'all remember miniature golf? The windmills and the water fountains and all the stuff? We went and played putt-putt. And my dad, my dad knocked one. And it did one of them swirly things around the hole. And then it shot off sideways. And my dad was frustrated. And I told my father for five bucks I'd sell him a mulligan and I wouldn't count that stroke. He didn't pay me. He just took it. You need to understand. There are no five dollar mulligan buyouts when God says it's over. When time is no more, there is no more time. 
That's why the scripture says, make your decision while it's still called today. Because we are not promised tomorrow. Because today in a church service somewhere, the last person to get saved may get saved. And you know what's going to happen? It's over. And the reason that God chose to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah is the same reason that God draws time to a close because it's his timetable and his choice and his rules and all we can do is this. God, I trust the scripture that you say. And just because I'm going to say this, we need to understand this. God's patience has a limit. God's grace has no bounds. But God's patience, it does not say that God is all suffering. It says he is long suffering. That means there's an end. God's patience ran out with Sodom and Gomorrah. And if you read the rest of the scriptures, God's patience is going to run out on earth. And just for free, the book of Revelation says that God's patience will run out in individual churches. And he says this, I will remove the lampstand when my patience runs out with you. I don't know of a more terrifying church to be in than one that God would remove the lampstand. And here's the worst part they'll still go and still do church without the presence of God available. And that's the choice of God. Point number three. I want us to understand who was destroyed. Who was destroyed? In the Sodom and Gomorrah narrative that we have, when they, they come and they begin to destroy and they begin to tear stuff up and they begin to say, okay, here's what's going to happen. I want you to realize and understand that it wasn't a pick and choose scenario. If you read back and read through when Abraham bargained with God, you remember that? If you don't, just go back and read chapter 18. Matter of fact, turn to chapter 18 now and look at verse 23. Abraham, Abraham says this, okay, God, are you really going to tear up everybody? And when you read what Abraham said, and he has this conversation, okay, God, I hate to ask one more favor, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I hate to ask this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. And God, every time says, because he's all-knowing and he knows the answer to it all, that he goes all the way down to ten righteous people. If there are ten righteous people in two cities, will you not destroy them? And God said, you know what, Abraham? You got a deal. I am going to look all over these two cities. And if I just find ten people that are righteous, I won't do it. Um, 23 verses later, they get destroyed. Why? Because there weren't even ten righteous. Read what it says there in verse 23 of chapter 18. Abraham came near. Came near. That means he walked up by God. And he said, Lord, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked, with the unrighteous, with those that are not right with you? Who is destroyed? Well, if you go back and you read what we just read, it says that the unrighteous, you, you, you get that right. <clears throat> the deal was, God said, I will spare the unrighteous if there are any righteous. If they all got destroyed, that means they were all unrighteous. Every single one of them was guilty. Every single person left in the city was condemned 
by God and his design for nature, for rule, for order, for law, by creation, by his very nature, these people were diametrically opposed to God. They were unrighteous. I have in my notes um, a, a, a phraseology that I think is for us an understanding. It is not unrealistic for us to have this conversation or this context for us today. That it is those who are opposed to God's word. God gives instruction. He gave instruction. He taught the language of instruction. The messengers were called messengers because they had a message to tell. Lot had followed Abram, knew who God was, had seen, heard, and understood how God spoke and worked and the miraculous nature of how God exercised his power in his goings and wanderings with Abram from Ur of the Chaldees. Abram, or Lot, lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. By language, it says he was a judge and lived in the city, or in the city walls. And he was the one who you had to pass by to gain entrance into town. He was in amongst them. Here's a question for you. Why couldn't God find more than 10 righteous people? Lot didn't do his job. Lot didn't tell anybody about who God was and what God could do and how God had worked and how God had rescued and how God had moved and what was going to happen if God was not pleased with them. God had impacted so much and Lot, Lot had done such an absolutely terrible job in sharing God's word that verse 30 of this passage begins one of the most horrific scenes in all of Scripture as far as a family is concerned. Where that two young virgin women molested, raped, and got impregnated by their very own father. Why? Because that's what they had grown up in. Because the unrighteousness of Sodom and Gomorrah had spilled over. It was exceedingly great and had even twisted and tainted Lot, Lot's wife, and their children. Please don't look at Lot and go, well, shame on him because all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And we all mess up. And we are all tainted by sin. There is a part of every believer that is perfect. Sometimes that part is great big internally and spiritually and we, we have great highs spiritually and the perfectness of us grows and there's times when in our flesh, our flesh rears up 
and the perfect part of us becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. That's why we're told to put on the whole armor of God and we're to be sober and vigilant because we have an adversary who's seeking whom he may devour. That's why we're to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift us up. That's why we're told to resist the devil and he will flee. That's why we're told to not become drunk with much wine which leads to dissipation. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not so that we are holier than now. It's so that we are found credible to the cause of Christ. We are not counted as unrighteous, but counted as righteous. I want you to look very last at this, what it says, what was destroyed. Look at verse 25. (coughs) The cities were destroyed. The valley, the word literally translates to the circle. The radius around them was destroyed. All the inhabitants of the city was destroyed. And even what was growing on the ground was destroyed. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't that just all the people got wiped out. It was the entirety of the civilization was gone, including whatever crops they had planted. The very earth at their feet was rendered destroyed. Here we go with the book of Revelation again. Revelation chapter 20 should be enough to spur us on to sharing the gospel with everybody that we come into contact with. Why? Because that passage says this, death and hell thrown into the lake of fire. But do you know what else? All the inhabitants of death and hell. And do you know what else? Anyone whose name is not found in the Lamb's book of life is cast into eternal fire. Every evil thing, every evil thought, every evil person, every evil deed, anything and everything that would separate someone from life in Christ is cast into the eternal damning fire of the lake of fire for all eternity. You need to understand this, and I just, this, this, is, this is one of those things. Hell is not eternal. I want you to understand that. Hell is not eternal. Because hell is consumed by the lake of fire. And so is death. That means anybody and everyone who has died and is in hell today is going to be transplanted from the place we know about where the worm ceaseth not the gnawing and the fire is never quenched and it's dark and there's no presence of God and they're going to be transferred into eternity burning in the lake of fire for all time. Now here's the problem. We don't really believe that. And y'all don't look spiritual because if you really believed it we'd have to beat people out of the door with a stick because we've shared the gospel with so many folks and people are accepting Christ if we truly believed that we got ours and you just can suffer and get your own whenever you want to. If we truly believe that, no, I've got mine and my job now is to tell you about what I've got. And it's not about me, it's about Christ and Christ alone. As the song says, would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? That's the real lyric, not whatever's in our current hymnal. Why? Why? Because we are worms. The scripture says we are poor, wretched, pitiful, and blind. And all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And we are separated from God. We are not heirs to the promise. We are not children of the promise. We can't do anything righteous enough for God to save us. And that's the beauty of the gospel. Is it does not matter who you are, where you are, where you've come from. The grace of God overcomes all sin. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. Not the thinking about the sin, no. That my sin, 
not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. It is well with my soul. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because they were evil. Understand this. The end of the book of Revelation says the same thing about all other evil things. When you get to Revelation chapter 20 and chapter 21, there's a great narrative there, a great passage of Scripture that says this. In the city, in that new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, all of the new creation, there is nothing in it. It lists it by name. The doors don't ever shut. Why? Because no evil can enter in. Even with the doors open, they can't enter in. Why? Because it doesn't exist any longer. So what does it mean for us today? Man, y'all listen slow today. What does it mean for us today? I want you to understand this. We need to be busy about sharing, telling, and understanding. We need to understand this, and we've talked about this. Sodom and Gomorrah, God waited, and he tarried. We, we, we claim that last verse of, of, of Revelation, the last verse of the Bible, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly, amen. That's our prayer. We, we always pray that. We, we, want, we want that to happen. We're looking forward to that day. But we need to understand our mindset needs to change. We have to change our mindset. Yes, we can say, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly, amen. But we should be saying, but until you come back, I've got one more day to tell one more person about God's great love. The reason God is waiting for his return is not so the church can get good enough. Ain't going to happen. If you find the perfect church, don't join it because you're going to mess it up. No, find a church that, needs, that, that is full of people who need grace, just like you do. And, and here's what happens. God invests himself and knits together the bride of Christ. And we as the church need to do this. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you who Jesus is. Let me tell you who he wants to be in your life. Let me tell you how you can get it. But we have to live our lives in such a way that it attracts people and not offends people. I need you to understand this. Christianity is offensive, and at times it can be offensive. Why? Because the word of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. And there are times people are going to be mad at you. Heaven forbid somebody posts something ugly on Facebook about you. Oh, no. Not social media. Dun, dun, dun. Guess what? I'd rather have my name written on 412 pages, ugly letters and ugly notes, but be standing for the cause of Christ because here's what I know. Ugly notes on Facebook are going to burn, but the Lamb's book of life is eternal. And we have to tell others about Jesus because if we don't we become Lot Lot became the father of the Ammonites the mortal enemies of the Israelites because of sin now I'm not saying you're going to go out of here and be, if you don't live right you're going to wind up causing the mortal enemies of God's people. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is uh, Gen, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 says this. If we continue to sin once we've been shown the truth, there is no sacrifice left for sin. Only the fearful wrath of the enemies of God. You're either for him or against him. There is no middle ground. I'm going to say this just because. 
I need you as a church to understand this. The first Sunday of this year, I made a promise to you. Made a, I made a promise. I did four years ago when I got called to pastor this joint. It was this. You invite and bring, and I will preach the truth. And here's what I believe today, above any other day. What we have heard today is the truth of God's Word. Even if it's not great fun to hear, even if the subject matter is a little off-putting, I don't want you leaving out of this place today going, that preacher just preached on gays. Not, uh, I didn't even use that word today. You said just now. I didn't preach about the ills and the trials and, of homosexuality. If all you heard today was that as the focus, you missed the last hour. Let me, because this. The homosexual sin is not any worse than ours. Because our sin is in need of as much grace as theirs. The only difference is this. I'm a sinner. Saved by grace. All the rest of that was introduction. This is the message. Are you saved by grace today? Because as we've talked about, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death. Eternal separation from life. And by eternal, that means eternal. Never ending. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love of God. And if you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Saved from what? Condemnation. Saved to what? To footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. And we can follow in the steps of Jesus wherever they may go. Why? Because he walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. And our prayer should be just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. That should be our prayer. If never in your life you've come to the place where you've accepted God's free gift of salvation by the method we just talked about. See, what I just described to you is not something I made up and it's not something in the back of a track book. It is from the book of Romans. And if you follow that Roman road, it leads you to Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there is therefore no more condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. 